ఎలిరోజు Yes, uh, I have started the live session. Yeah, okay, okay Neeraj, over to you. Just one minute, sir. Yeah. Just one minute. Akash, it's not live, right? Oh. Make me host. Thank you. థ్యాంక్స్ డాక్టర్ నీరజ్ గుడ్ ఈవినింగ్ టు ఆల్ ఆర్ రిస్పెక్టెడ్ డాక్టర్స్ welcome to this eighth edition of uh, ruma dg conclave today as usual as every month we show a new speaker with a new topic and a very interesting discussion in uh, rheumatology today we have a very senior speaker from chennai it is none other than respected dr v krishnamurthy sir dr v krishnamurthy sir is a consultant rheumatologist at the chennai minakshi hospital and the apollo speciality hospital fortis malar as well as sir as the ceo of the chennai minakshi multi speciality hospital in chennai in his academic uh, career sir has a 20 years of teaching experience at the madras medical and the stanley medical college he has published several papers and contributed to many chapters in the api textbook as well as the manual of rheumatology he has organized the aplar 2015 international rheumatology congress in chennai the acr annual meeting planning committee member sir has also been a committee member at the copd corrd core and also has received numerous awards out of which the important ones being the maitland memorial Medic- medal for the clinical medicine in 1979 by the mmc the dhanvantri award for clinical research in 1995 the best doctor award for by dr mgr medical university 2013 in chennai and the ira master award in 2019 so today sir is here to speak about a very common topic and a very interesting topic which is practical problems in the rheumatology practice so with this i would hand over the session to dr krishnamurthy sir to take over over to you sir you can share your screen good evening to all uh, the members who are here today evening thanks for joining us for this meeting and my special thanks to dr patel for his recording uh, in progress Patel for his introduction. Thank you, Dr. Patel. And my thanks to Zydus, which has organized this meeting. And all others who are behind the scene who have helped me in coming and uh, interacting with you today. So let me share my screen with you. Is it visible now? Yes, sir. Please go. Yeah. Yeah. yeah today the the targeted audience i was not very clear but what i was told was that uh, it is uh, for orthopedic surgeons and people who are in general practice as well as who are interested in rheumatology so this is mainly given for a practical approach or the cases which we come across or i do come across in my practice and where some difficult areas are there so we will keep this as a, a sort of Uh, atlas or a color atlas and uh, we'll discuss on the problems and then on the question and answer session i'll be I'm able so to sorry to interrupt sir uh, program has not gone live because of some technical glitch i can see okay uh, fine uh, audience is not be able to see you live uh, okay. dr salim yeah 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 maitri ma'am can you please help us neera sir neera sir did you change any setting uh dr neeraj 
I think, but it is showing live or auto TV actually. No, no, it's not live on YouTube, sir. That's why also some technical what? issue is there. Sorry, sir. Uh, please bear with us. Uh, yeah, no problem. Am I audible to you people and uh, am I yeah, visible yeah. to you? Yeah. Then it's yeah, 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 yeah. That's why actually I was switching from audience to panel to check this okay. thing, this thing only. Okay. But I came to know that it's not going live. Oh. Doctor Neeraj, uh, Doctor Salim, please call him. Acha. Uh, Neeraj live nahi ja rahe. Sir, what you did exactly because. send your stream key it's automatically live sir I'm setting up new stream. Yes. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. You just continue from there. Yeah. Shall I start? Yes, sir. You can start. Okay. Sorry to interrupt, sir. Uh, Doctor Salim, you have to start from the beginning, I think. Uh, okay. Sir, you have to start from the beginning. Okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, Make the introduction a little brief. That's all. Uh, yes, no sir. Problem. I'll have to yeah. share my screen again, sir. Fine. I'll stop. Yeah. Yeah, so some technical issues had come on, so we were unable to uh, start on time. Uh, we, I apologize for the delay. So uh, let's get going with the today's session. We have uh, Dr. V. Krishnamurti, sir, who are consultant rheumatologist from Chennai Minakshi Hospital. He's the CEO, as well as got attachments at the Apollo Speciality Fortis Malar, as well as uh, a CEO at the Chennai Minakshi Multi Speciality Hospital with a vast experience in rheumatology. With 20 years teaching experience at uh, the Madras Medical and Stanley Medical College, with n number of publications and chapters in various books, sir has also been an uh, award receiver for many prestigious awards like the Dhanvantri Award, the Maitland Memorial Medal, the Best Doctor Award by, by the MGR Medical University 2013, and the IRA Master Award in 2019. So today's sir's topic is about uh, practical problems faced in rheumatology. So I would now like to ask uh, sir to share the screen. And get going with the topic. Over to you, sir. Yes, sir. 
Yeah. Yeah, the size is visible. Yeah. Good evening, uh, viewers, dear doctors. Thanks to Ciders. And I'm sorry about the technical glitch. We'll straight away go for the talk so that we will catch up some time. Uh, oh, my God. Okay. Is it? Yeah. Are the slides visible now? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's visible. Yeah, fine. So the talk is aimed for uh, simple clinical problems that we encounter in day-to-day -day practice, particularly at the orthopedic uh, level. I was told the, uh, the viewers are mainly orthopedic people and people are practicing a little clinical rheumatology. So we'll see a few cases and uh, how the, we have problem in diagnosing as well as in uh, organizing the treatment protocol. And then we'll have an interactive session. It's a case of rheumatoid arthritis. This is what happens in rheumatoid when treatment is not given properly. So we have to avoid such a scenario where a patient is totally crippled due to uh, deformities because of uh, not instituting the treatment on time. So rheumatoid arthritis can be very easily managed if the treatment is instituted at the right time for the right patient, the right type of drugs, and the right dose. I find a lot of prescriptions um, where a minuscule dose of methotrexate or um, I am, I am, I am in, uh, combinations which are not, um, I mean, not logical, illogical combination of disease modifying drugs. These sort of things are seen. So the aim of a physician will be to reduce the pain and inflammation and to prevent. Whenever the inflammation is brought down, naturally the bone or joint damage, cartilage damage comes down and thereby we prevent deformity. And our aim should always be for remission. Certain cases, we will not be able to reach remission, but at least we can bring about low disease activity. Once you bring a low disease activity of the illness or bring in remission, naturally the quality of life becomes good and the feeling of well-being is there. And we then try to reduce the drug load or the medication so that the patient has got minimum drugs. Normally, the, as physicians or as doctors, we always feel that we have achieved what we... Uh, yeah, some, some background noise is there. Yeah. So, Dr. Neeraj, can you mute your mic, please? Yes, sir. So the reduction of drug uh, medication is very important. So normally we feel happy that we brought out a remission, reduction in ESR, number of fold and joints have come down, number of tender joints have come down like that. But unfortunately, the patient may not be happy. So if you see in any international thing, there is always a physician's assessment as well as the patient's side also. So unless if the patient becomes happy, we have not achieved the target. That's what we have to keep in mind. So apart from it's not only what you see, the parameters, clinical parameters, you also should win the confidence of the patient. And the patient has to tell really, yes, doctor, I'm happy and comfortable like that. That should be the aim of treatment in uh, dealing with a chronic disease like rheumatoid arthritis. So what drugs do we have? All very simple conventional drugs, steroids. It's often used and misused. Non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, again, um, we have to be very careful in, in uh, handling these drugs. Uh, right and left one should not use non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. And don't combine NSAIDs that we always see morning one NSAID, afternoon one NSAID, and night another one, and the improper dosing. And um, so that has to be avoided. So use it at the right time, bring about a, a reduction in inflammation and withdraw the drug. Always keep in mind the side effects of these drugs, particularly the renal toxicity and the erosion. This have to be kept in mind. In steroids, you have to keep in mind of steroid uh, overdose like um, um, osteoporosis, diabetes, hypertension. And these are the other common side effects of steroids. And this is modifying drugs or ideal drugs, but they don't uh, act immediately. They take time to act. So until we get some pain relief, initially we combine steroids or NSAIDs and start disease modifying drugs at the right dose and bring about a remission. Once the remission or the disease activity comes down, we come out of steroids and NSAIDs. 
in spite of disease modifying drugs sometimes patients do not respond they will need biologicals uh, or the newer molecules called small molecules which are called as jack inhibitors now it's available easily after the patent uh, thing has gone off um, two molecules are available in india and of course the ortho role comes in in the form of joint replacement hip replacement knee replacement like that physiotherapy the rehabilitation counseling all those things matter in treatment for this patient if it consider disease modifying drugs as of now in the international guidelines and they concentrate more on sulfasalicin lefronamide and methotrexate in india we use hydroxychloroquine a newer molecule has come as called igorotimod and uh, this is approved only in china and japan it's there for the last 10 years i will um, uh, share a few slides on this particular molecule which is being used of late uh, in india and uh, my uh, usage of this molecule is somewhat limited i am very choosy about using this molecule but many of my colleagues have used this molecule and they say it's quite okay anyway now whatever experience i have i will share it with you so we'll go for case number 1 and this is a young woman about 30 years married and uh, she has one child she is planning for another child soon and she has symmetrical polyarthritis with her ra factor positive anti ccp positive aggressive rheumatoid arthritis and she has intolerance to methotrexate number of people do not um, um, yeah, react well to methotrexate many of them will have dyspepsia or they'll have extreme fatigue they'll feel as if they have been cut by an axe and um, the whole day but usually we give it as weekly dose i prefer them saturdays and sundays because people will be at home and um, they will feel that uh, they will be totally bedridden some people so that type of type of intolerance is seen to people with uh, methotrexate some people uh, their hepatic liver enzymes get elevated with methotrexate some will have interstitial lung disease where methotrexate will not be we can't be able to use and as there are people who have inadequate response to methotrexate also and this is a young lady she wants to have uh, one more child because of the pressure from the family will be there invariably most of us our patients in india will be either man to positive or tb cold quantity plant positive and as doctors we cater to a variety of uh, plethora of patients a wide spectrum from the have nots to the ultra, uh, ultra rich so here affordability also becomes a problem there's a middle class person uh, with school going uh, child one child and uh, husband with a um, moderate wages to spend money for um, every month about 10000 or 20000 per month it's a big problem for them so this sort of background is this patient so what are the hurdles here is apart from cost is uh, tb positive that is just because mantu is positive or tb gold quantiferon is positive doesn't mean they are positive for tb but when we use drugs like biological agents uh, tnf alpha blockers it can uh, kindle the latent tuberculosis and patient may land up with uh, uh, tuberculosis suddenly what is it done kept under control by the immune system will be unleashed by the biological agents since she wanted to have a child we cannot plan for leflunamide for her and um, the other uh, uh, things uh, sorry the slide is i have skipped and done okay and um, intolerance to methotrexate so i could not go much with uh, normal dosing is about 15 mg to 25 mg but here we could give only 2.5 mg on saturdays and 2.5 mg on sundays more than that the patient could not tolerate and there is always a lurking fear of biologicals and a few sub jack inhibitors in our country the jack inhibitors herpes zoster is quite common some people do not respond well they develop infection so that sort of a thing when you give the small letters in the literature they get even if they are fit for these drugs many people run away from reading the side effects of molecules in such a scenario and now added to the Uh, pressure is the covid scenario where again our hands are tied and uh, we are a bit careful where more so when patients are not vaccinated we are a little hesitant to start them on biologicals 
or jack inhibitors so such a scenario what are the uh, options we have no one minute so so if if it is planning for future pregnancy naturally leflunamide is contraindicated for intolerance to methotrexate we try to reduce the methotrexate dose split dose sometimes we try parenteral injections also where some of them tolerate well but many of them once they develop intolerance for methotrexate they do not uh, respond well so with a positive gold um, tb gold quantifron test or a man to test biologicals and nips are I'm sorry for the spelling mistake or uh, again it's a contraindicated we have to treat them for latent tb and then we can try and start them again cost factor and then because of covid pandemic rituximab is a contraindicated better not to use rituximab though it is little cheaper than the other biologicals and it acts for, for about 6 months to 1 year so you have to be careful better to use it only for a patient who has been fully vaccinated and who has got adequate antibodies so these are the practical situations a few so what we thought was we will add egorotimod mode for this patient it was a little few points about this molecule so methane sulfonylamide i told you it is Uh, approved by the chinese and japanese uh, associations it's widely used since 2011 it has got multiple mechanism of action but the main mechanism of action is the uh, nuclear uh, factor kappa b inhibition that is the uh, main thing apart from that it can have mild anti inflammatory and analgesic effects so the indications you should know it is mainly used for inadequately responding to methotrexate or biologicals or patients who have intolerance to disease modifying drugs the dose is you start with 25 mg once a day for four weeks see whether the patient is able to tolerate and then later increase it to 25 mg did the contraindications should not be used if the patient is pregnant and um, this uh, drug molecule increases sometimes causes transaminitis so liver enzymes can get elevated so you have to monitor them like methotrexate for every 3 months on liver function so if patient has got hepatic insufficiency do not or if the liver enzymes get elevated by twice or thrice three times the normal it should be stopped then patients with peptic ulcer again when you are going to use with nsaids be careful patients of course with any hypersensitivity or allergy and patients on those cases so this is uh, something on egorotty mode on a young woman who has got intolerance to methotrexate and who has uh, tb positive where we have her hands are tied due to covid as well as to tb positive biological and uh, um, jack inhibitors as well as since planning for a pregnancy leflunamide so our choice will be towards security mode combination with the low dose methotrexate and of course hydroxychloroquine we'll go to the next case where a 35 year old female where sare effect was positive anti ccp positive and uh, she had uh, uh, skin lesions also psoriasis and symmetrical polyarthritis so naturally uh, people will think whether it is psoriatic arthritis or um, this uh, rheumatoid arthritis since rheumatoid factor was positive and she had symmetrical polyarthritis something like this um when you see such a hand which is beautiful and spindle shaped with tenderness on the pip joints or mcp joints apart from rheumatoid arthritis um of course in psoriatic arthritis little asymmetricity will be there and one joint will be more involved than the other Uh, i'll show you some pictures on that you should always keep in mind the diseases like sle also systemic lupus many a times will present like this without much of sign of it very early rheumatoid it be like that so since patient had symmetrical arthritis and uh, ra factor anticp was positive many a times psoriasis can coexist with ra in such cases we make a diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis with psoriasis and you will just give only skin ointments or creams for the psoriasis so you have to weigh the clinical features and the pattern of involvement psoriatic arthritis will present in a different five different forms we'll discuss that in the coming uh, few cases always look for synovitis 
I have seen people um, taking MRI and then in the MRI, they will make a diagnosis of synovitis and that will get um, um, diverted towards, um, in a case of psoriatic arthritis, will get diverted to rheumatoid also. So better to look for clinical synovitis, synovial thickening, particularly it'll be well made out over the wrist and in the elbow area around the olecranon and in the knee joint also. And look for patients with enthesitis or sausaging of digits. These two points will favor more of psoriatic arthritis than that of rheumatoid arthritis. When in doubt, don't start them on hydroxychloroquine because they say hydroxychloroquine and certain NSAIDs and beta blockers can aggravate psoriatic skin lesions. So best is to combine try only methotrexate or a combination of methotrexate with leflunamide or sulfasalicin then that will take care of both the psoriatic skin lesions as well as that of the rheumatoid arthritis. So that is the lesson we learn whenever you are in doubt of whether it is a rheumatoid arthritis or if a patient has got classical rheumatoid with the psoriatic skin lesions, better to stick to methotrexate or leflunamide or sulfasalicin and try to avoid hydroxychloroquine. Here in this, um, you can, I'm sorry, uh, see the you can see the sausaging of the toes and see the dystrophic nails here. This is very classical of um, uh, psoriatic arthritis. You will not get a picture like uh, this in rheumatoid arthritis. So with the careful eyes, if you look at the nails and the type of um, involvement you can make a diagnosis of psoriatic arthritis very easily. I showed you a hand of rheumatoid, one with deformity, the other one a beautiful spindle-shaped thing. See this difference here. This finger, this PIP is normal, whereas this one is affected. And the whole finger is swollen. It's called sausaging because of the tendon sheets are also involved. Soft tissues are involved, dystrophic nails, elevated nails. And under the nail, you have uh, this patient is have uh, is having uh, hyperkeratosis, and uh, that the white flakes are falling off. Subungual hyperkeratosis. That's what we see. So many a times a patient will present with um, arthritis, but the skin lesions may not be very visible like this. Telltale evidence won't be there, and it will be hidden elsewhere. So we have to see because this man was bald, we were able to pick it up. If, imagine having. Um, full of uh, hair, it becomes difficult to pick up these cases. So you have to make, you make it a point to ask for a diagnosis of psoriasis or dandruff, put in a leading question, you'll be, or ask for family history of psoriasis, it might be clue. And meanwhile, also ask them whether they had plantar fasciitis or achilles tendonitis like that in the history. That will again give us a, an idea that this patient is more towards psoriatic arthritis. And they will have sort of asymmetrical arthritis. Distal interphalangeal joint involvement is more common with psoriatic arthritis. So these are some of the points in favor of psoriatic arthritis and that of rheumatoid arthritis. And one another case I will show you how it is presenting. In this case of psoriatic arthritis, a male 37 years comes to us with low back pain and neck pain, and his RA factor was positive. A patient had hypothyroidism being treated for hypothyroidism and also has psoriasis. Psoriasis can manifest something like uh, ankylosing spondylitis. We call it as axial spondylarthropathy. So one of the manifestations of psoriasis is not peripheral arthritis, but its involvement of the cervical spine and the um, uh, lumbar spine. They can get affected and can mimic like uh, ankylosing spondylitis. So it is... Um, uh, it comes under spondylarthropathy group also, psoriatic arthritis with uh, axial skeletal involvement. Here, this patient has got RA factor positive. So normally, uh, spinal involvement is very uncommon in rheumatoid other than the in atlantoaxial joint uh, involvement. So neck pain can occur in rheumatoid as well as in psoriatic arthritis or in ankylosing spondylitis. So in a patient classical with neck pain, don't ignore that. Kindly do MRI or an X-ray of cervical spine or CT and look for the atlantoaxial dislocation is there or not. And uh, intervention at the right time is very important to prevent major hazard for the patient later. 
So here, why is this RA factor positive? So this is the point here. A positive RA factor can be due to hypothyroidism because there is concurrent autoimmune uh, disorder, autoimmune thyroiditis can lead to positive RA factor and can mislead you or could be a red herring. Whereas the anti-CCP will be negative and so that more fortifies your, you know, take it with a pinch of salt of this RA factor. And when other parameters are not in favor of um, uh, rheumatoid arthritis. Here, this patient has no peripheral involvement and lack of symmetrical or small joint involvement, no synovitis, axial skeletal involvement, male sex. So in such conditions, think of psoriatic arthritis with spinal involvement. Avoid hydroxychloroquine. Best is to start them on methotrexate and evaluate the patient. So this is the spine, cervical spine of this patient. This is psoriatic arthritis with spine involvement. This is ankylosing spondylitis with spinal involvement. And this is rheumatoid arthritis. You can see the erosion in the dense odontite process. And this space will get wide and because of the annular ligament here gets ruptured. That's the problem. So we'll not go to rheumatoid, but if you see the syndesmophytes, it's an advanced case of ankylosing spondylitis. We call it as axial spondylarthropathy or axial spondylarthropathy with peripheral arthritis if there is peripheral joint involvement is there. This will be pencil-shaped, uh, sharp or razor-sharp syndesmophytes. Whereas in psoriatic arthritis, of course, that occurs later stages only. We have to catch them early. They'll have very thick, fleshy syndesmophytes. And it'll be skip lesions. It'll be one here, one there. So you can see something abridging syndesmophyte, but very thick one. And young people, even today I saw a patient who's only 36 years with uh, simulating like ankylosing spondylitis. Many a times they will get mistaken for a disease called DISH also, diffuse idiopathic skeletal hyperostosis. But of course, that occurs in the elderly and more so in diabetic patients where three or four contiguous vertebral bodies, anterior longitudinal ligament will get calcified. So this is how the difference between psoriatic arthritis and ankylosing spondylitis occurs. So that was a patient with psoriatic arthritis with uh, um, a sacroiliac joint involvement. And uh, the unilateral sacroiliac EITs is common with psoriatic arthritis. They'll have bone marrow edema, well seen in T2 weighted images. One common problem which I see with orthopedic uh, practice, uh, particularly I want to tell that, don't feel bad about it. Like here, let, it's an open uh, fora. That's why I thought I will share my views. Many times when patients with um, back pain are seen by them, they just do MRI of the lumbar spine. Uh, and uh, they never fail to tell the uh, radiologist to screen for SI joint or sacroiliitis. So what happens when the patient comes there, again forced to go back to the scan center for MRI scan of the uh, sacroiliac joint. So a sacroiliac joint MRI picks up very early ankylosing spondylitis or really early psoriatic arthritis with the axial skeletal involvement. T1 and T2 weighted images plus ask for still images shorter inversion ratios, STIER. Now, a new method also has come, uh, 3D MRI, like VIBE, V-I-B-E, that also brings about more better data or quality of information. That is for the pundits. And so whenever, any for any back pain, kindly include SI joint also, ask them for T1 and T2 plus STIER images so that we catch early case and so that we don't make a diagnosis of only intervertebral disc prolapse. We can pick up so many other allied uh, diseases which can mimic like sacroiliitis. Unilateral sacroiliitis is quite common with um, you know, psoriatic arthritis. In fact, this patient was referred to me by my colleague uh, who was an orthopedic surgeon. A good rapport always is there between the ortho and rheumatology uh, confluence or conclave, and we can pick up and treat cases very well. So that is very important in, uh, in MRI, particularly still images. Two, three sections are very important. Sportsman, repeated uh, injury, uh, repetitive injuries, and parturition. After labor, patients can develop bone marrow edema, and they can be, again, a red herring and misc uh, direct view. So be careful in making a diagnosis of sacroiliitis, particularly 
with sports people or with um, a woman who has recently delivered. So they have the differential diagnosis. See this patient who the hidden psoriatic lesion. Many a time he was so shy that he couldn't, uh, he refused to show and then we had to look for, try to look for psoriatic skin lesions in um, the gluteal cleft, submammary region. Uh, these are common and behind the ears or the scalp or the frontal areas of the face and the elbow region and pretibial areas. These are the common areas. So we'll go to case number four, I think. Uh, let me see that we have time. Yeah. So it's a case of um, a male who's 40 years old, small joint swelling, like symmetrical, simulating like a rheumatoid. And, uh, and the history is very important. Dietary indiscretion, alcohol, and on and off attacks of joint pain. Suddenly he'll get uh, joint pain and then it'll subside. But all um, the spindling of joints, small joints are affected. And it was our effect was positive and raised ESR and CRP. So what is that? This is the presentation. You can see it's almost just having a look at it, we will make a diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis. No, there's no nail changes. So psoriasis is ruled out. Try to look for skin lesions over these areas. Uh, Palmar psoriasis will be there. So we'll move out from psoriasis. We are moving out to some uh, disease where a rheumatoid-like presentation of what is that? We will see in the next slide. There's not much of synovitis here. So this looked like a rheumatoid arthritis with on and off. So swollen small joints, swollen knees, ankles, high blood pressure, RA factor positivity, anti-CCP negative, but uric acid was very high, so the dyslipidemia. The metabolic syndrome is there for this patient, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, high triglycerides, obesity. So with high uric acid, naturally, gout is what we keep in mind. So if they present like this with an acute single joint involvement, particularly classical joints like MPP joint or the thumb, then you make a diagnosis of gout straight away and you become easier. But when they come with uh, this sort of cold joints, uh, symmetrically involved with swelling, on and off episodic attack, it becomes difficult, as well as when RA factor also is positive. Usually gout and rheumatoid don't co coexist, but we do see cases. It's a little rare combination. So at this juncture, look for this. Bring these following points into mind. Episodic attacks, lack of synovial thickening. You will see something like a gooseberry, bony, or a little hard nodule-like uh, feeling rather than soft uh, tissue feel. And the pattern of joint involvement, on asymmetrical, one knee here, one ankle there. And laboratory parameters, of course, uric acid may be normal also during acute attacks due to severe inflammation. Uric acid will be normal. So don't get fooled by that. And so try to look into old records and see whether there was any high index of, I mean, uh, high level of uric acid previously. Or even you can ask the patient whether at any point of time uric acid was checked and whether it was high. Age and sex, male, and uh, habits like alcohol, high non veg consumption, or family history of um, gout. So sometimes we give, uh, you suspect uh, gout, and then you can give colchicine, and urate lowering therapy and see the response. That way, the pendulum will swing more towards a polyarticular gout. So the, here, the, the patient had polyarticular gout simulating rheumatoid arthritis. And though RA factor was positive, we did not treat them for rheumatoid arthritis. Check renal parameters. Many people will have impaired renal function, and because of that, high uric acid level will go up. And then... Um, I'll look for other comorbid conditions like this lipidemia. It's a case of polyarticular. This is a tophaceous gout. A patient had tophae. You can see the tophae in the ankle over here and in the MTP joint. It got infected and it was exuding uric acid crystals. So, and sometimes they will have this olecranon and bursitis is very characteristic of gout, uh, gouty tophae can be mistaken for subcutaneous nodules and rheumatoid arthritis. Tophae form in the peripheries where it is cold. The body temperature, surface temperature is lower at the pinna. I'll show you another. This gentleman from the African continent, tophae on the eyelids here. The polyarticle, this is a tophae and not synovitis. 
a case of polyarticular gout to facious gout. So treatment will be naturally urate lowering therapy and during active attack you give colchicine and look after the comorbid conditions. Uh, another case with this, I think we can go in for discussion. A 50 year old female, very recently this lady came. She had asymmetrical arthritis, right elbow, left knee, and left ankle swelling and pain, as referred by the orthopedic surgeon. The thing is, it was of very short duration, only one week, but they had already started on methotrexate. What was disturbing was uh, about five or six MRI she had, MRI of knees, elbows, shoulder, ankle, like that. I didn't enumerate all the MRIs. It looked bad. So six or seven MRIs for a patient who had only one week of joint pain, some ankle pain and thing. She gave history of fever. The CRP, ESR were all raised. And um, of course, steroids and CD. Within one week, everything, all a cocktail was uh, used. So never jump and treat a patient of one week uh, arthritis with disease modifying drug. That is the message I want to tell you. Take your time, relieve the pain, work out the case, work up the case and see. Many a times it could be due to a recent viral infection which would have triggered a symmetrical arthritis. I find a number of cases with arthritis pain coming after vaccination or after COVID and um, chicken gunia like that. There is one another entity called as reactive arthritis where a patient can secondary to urinary urogenital infection or gastroenteritis. They can develop more so the urogenital infection used to be common with um, uh, younger age group and because of sexual activity. We don't see that much nowadays. So any short history of less than six weeks, be careful. Don't jump and start disease modifying drug. And uh, episodic attacks, asymmetrical, any preceding fever, diarrhea, or urinary tract infection, young age, uh, these things um, will favor more towards reactive arthritis. Be careful and in doubt, wait, need not jump. And uh, asymmetrical arthritis is common. You see here, this patient can see the PIP joint involvement here, a right knee effusion. This sort of thing, they'll come, they can be a little migratory one day here, one day there, and um, uh, they do very well with uh, treatment. Most of the time, after a few episodes, they'll disappear also. Only there are certain type of rare types are there, the free active arthritis, like Reiter syndrome, the former name. They can have very devastating uh, consequences with skin lesions, eye lesions, uh, genital lesions like that. And this is a case of uh, chicken gunia arthritis. You can see the symmetrical small joint involvement, puffy leg, pedal edema. They do well with uh, low-dose steroids and hydroxychloroquine. Now with COVID also, we are seeing similar viral arthritis. So viral arthritis also you have to keep in mind. So they do well with low-dose steroids. Very rarely, so recurrent attacks, we prefer sulfasalacin or methotrexate for these people. Low dose steroids or NSAIDs will be fine for these patients if there are no contraindication. So, with this, I will uh, stop uh, presenting cases. We can go for the question hour so that we can have some interaction and uh, I'll be able to uh, try, try to answer your question as much right. as possible. Uh, first of all, sir, an excellent presentation. Uh, bang on cases, especially for the interest of the orthopedicians. So there are a few questions here regarding uh, the presentation as well. Uh, the first question is, sir, the basic differentiating point between a case of an SLE versus a mixed connective tissue disorder. So how yeah. do you differentiate that? Sir? Yeah. If it's an orthopedic surgeon, I will not ask him to handle such cases. Lupus and MCTD should go to pundits. Your job will be only to make a diagnosis of a mostly an autoimmune problem, not routine rheumatoid or psoriasis. It is something beyond where the ANA is positive like that. Right. So in SLE, it will be classical presentation, like ANA will be positive. A patient can have malar rash or oral ulcers, hair loss, uh, like that. We can easily pick up. Sometimes a patient can present something like a rheumatoid arthritis, symmetrical polyarthritis. And the ANA will be positive. There may not be uh, rashes 
there may not be oral ulcers. The typical features of lupus will not be there. Or they can have a one malar rash and scleroderma-like phase. Then they can have, well, we use the term systemic sclerosis for um, scleroderma. So they can have a feature of a uh, little systemic sclerosis, a little SLE. This sort of combination is called as mixed connective tissue disease. Like that old Kisan jam, we call it as a little um, goa, some grapes, some tomato like that. They'll make mixed fruit jam. Those days it was there. I don't know that it's still there. So like that, they will have features of three or four conditions like lupus, systemic sclerosis, dermatomyositis or polymyositis, rheumatoid like that. Then we call it as mixed connective. If it is undifferentiated connective tissue disease, or overlap, we call it as, they can have features of rheumatoid with some features of um, SLE, we call it as overlap. So patients are having joint pain, uh, photosensitivity, or a Raynaud's phenomena with the ANA positivity, we can label it as undifferentiated connective tissue disease or UCTD. Whereas if they have classical features, if the ANA is positive, and you do an ANA profile, or we call it as ENA, extractable nuclear antigen. And if the anti-Rho is positive, or anti-SM antibody is positive, and DSDNA is positive, definite uh, lupus. If DSDNA is negative, ANA positive with Rho, SSA, or anti-SM antibody positive, the lab test, it favors more enough lupus. Whereas in uh, mixed connective tissue disorder, anti-U1 RNP, that ENA uh, subtyping, that will be positive. positive. That patient will go into that category. Okay. But many a times, uh, suddenly they will change from one end to the other. Spectra will change. So these patients should be monitored preferably by a rheumatologist who is well-versed. And long-term follow-up is important because suddenly their kidneys can get affected. They can develop nephritis. And sometimes life-threatening thing also come down. Absolutely. The quality of life will be affected. So better right. to refer these patients refer. once you diagnose. Right, sir. right. So coming to the next question, this is about JAK inhibitors. Yeah. Uh, there are two questions related to JAK inhibitors. First is, would you start it as a primary first-line therapy in case of an RA? And secondly, if you're using tofacitinib, what are the risk factors associated with it? Yeah, we can use it as a first line, but uh, only people who are well experienced better to so as far as you are concerned, I would prefer you to start only with methotrexate hydroxychloroquine first, and they don't respond, switch over to tofastinate. Even then, methotrexate tofa combination is ideal. And then if they do very well, withdraw methotrexate and maintain them on tofa if they can afford and if there are no side effects. Okay. As far as tofa is concerned, one should follow the initial screening. The patient should be hepatitis B negative, hepatitis C negative, you have to do this test. HIV should be negative. Now COVID vaccine, better to tell the patient they should have got vaccinated. After one month after the second dose only, you should venture to start this drug. Don't start it in pandemic time. The handicap is pandemic time, you have to be careful. And um, uh, two things you have to be careful. And then the man to test also should be negative. I had a patient recently who was Mantu negative. We didn't do well with methotrexate, inadequate responder. We started her on um, um, tofastinib. Third month, she developed uh, tuberculosis of the um, in the bone. Right. Mm, in the sacral area, she developed tuberculosis. Right. So now she is an anti-TB drug. And uh, in spite of being man to negative and gold quantifron being negative. So even in TOFA, we get uh, tuberculosis. Right. So you, you have to be careful. Herpes zoster is quite common. So that is one thing. Another thing is anemia occurs in most of our patients. Most of our women will have anemia of chronic disease, women in rheumatoid arthritis. And again, nutritionally also, Indian women will have low hemoglobin. So first in a, the JAK inhibitors uh, come into the pathway of um, erythropoietin. So there, um, that way HP level might come down. So you have to keep a watch on cell count, hemoglobin, and uh, look for infections. So right. these are the parameters. 
Absolutely. Very rarely we can start, um, suppose a patient, a um, uh, young person who has got all the healthy thing, but only severe arthritis, we can try. Nothing wrong in that, but as per um, your, um, international guidelines, I will not advocate that. Always go by the algorithm. Start with a regular disease-modifying drug, then only you should add. So we'll stick to that. Right. Starting first will be only for the pundit. Don't get caught in a legal hurdle. Right, right. Perfect. So now coming to the COVID vaccination, now these questions yeah. are from some physicians. Yeah. So they have been using a lot of uh, prednisolone uh, in yeah. their practice. So now what is the criteria, sir, when you go for vaccination? Yeah. What should be the dose regimen for which of prednisolone you can allow the patient to go yeah, on? Up to 20 milligram, it's allowed. Yeah. Anything to above 20 milligram, better not to. Below right. 20 is fine. It's fine, right, sir. because it may be have an impact on the efficacy of the vaccine. Yeah, naturally. Immunosuppressive effect will be there. Immunosuppressive effect. Right, perfect. So another question related to the vaccine. This is between the choice of uh, rituximab and uh, methotrexate. What is your stay, how, whether they should be discontinued and for how long before taking For them? vaccination. For vaccination. Yeah, rituximab should not be given. Uh, only after one month after vaccination, you can plan for rituximab. Right. Methotrexate, the guideline is you stop for the first week of uh, immediately after vaccination. Right. So, the one week after vaccination, don't give methotrexate. Right. Likewise, nibs also, tofastinib also for one week. Tofastinib is a daily dose. So, one week we don't give from the day of vaccination or one day before. Methotrexate, I tell patients like this, because my patients take methotrexate on Saturdays and Sundays. Right. So I tell them you take a, a vaccine either on Wednesday, Thursday or Friday. Saturday, Sunday you skip and then start it the week after. So they get about 10 days gap between the vaccine and that methotrexate. Right, right. Other so, drugs, there is no contraindication. There is no contraindication, right. So another, this is the last question, sir. This is a case yeah. which uh, a physician wants to discuss with you a 50-year-old female with persistent upper and lower back problems and stiffness, history of dandruff, then pain, stiffness in the right ankle, ESR 110, CRP is around 2, RA positive, ANA positive, ROLA positive. Biopsy shows lymphocytes and also it shows impaired functions in the right parotid region. So the SI joint is normal on the MRI scan. What could be the possible diagnosis? Anti-Rho is positive. Anti-Rho is positive, sir. And any parotid in... in uh, parotid, sir, there is impaired function of the parotid, right parotid. Uh, what about dry mouth and dry eyes? Uh, those symptoms have not been mentioned. Yeah, not there. Right, right. Because Jogren syndrome is one condition Absolutely. where patients can have RA factor positive, row positive, and they'll have dry eyes and dry mouth, can have symmetrical polyarthritis. Right. And um, we can think of uh, Jogren syndrome. Jogren syndrome. But here it is, but Jogren syndrome, axial skeletal involvement will not be there. Right. And um, asymmetrical presentation also will not be there. Right, right. So in such cases, you said some skin lesion was there. Yeah, whether it's dandruff, serious, dandruff was dandruff. there. So get an opinion from the dermatologist whether it is psoriasis. Okay. Whether a patient, then they can have psoriatic arthritis, spinal involvement, and also look for any secondary jaw grants because secondary jaw grant in psoriatic arthritis is very, very unlikely to be there. Right, right. And the age also is little on the higher side, 50. Right. So I would think first try to rule out psoriatic arthritis. And if still in doubt, a low dose steroid will take care of the parotid uh, problem, mm -hmm. and methotrexate also will take care of parotid as well as psoriatic arthritis. So, low dose steroid with methotrexate combination will be ideal for this patient until you clinch the diagnosis. Right. right. Perfect. And so, one final question which has just come yeah. up. Uh, this was what we had discussed about tofacitinib. Uh, another option whether baricitinib can be used in place as it is a cheaper option. So, would you suggest to start it as a first yeah. thing from a physician yeah. point of view? Both uh, tofa and bari are very good molecules. Right. But it is like using a revolver. Be happy. Don't be trigger happy. Right. Be careful in choosing your patient because uh, we have to gather more experience in our Indian population. Now, with the patent laws gone 
and everybody is using it and more so with covid our time the vaccine okay. was widely used absolutely so be careful with the molecule definitely herpes zoster is one major second will be tuberculosis absolutely and uh, third will be uh, cell counts hemoglobin level and uh, other parameters on lipids and other things so you have to keep so only if you can monitor these patients well with periodic um, uh, laboratory test Right. and um, <clears throat> patient should come for follow up so this uh, ensure all those things sure perfect so that's it so that is the questions what we have received yeah. on behalf of zydus uh, sinogas yeah. and i thank you for joining us on this session i apologize for the technical delay which happened yeah. sir unwantedly i mean as you know yeah. this is a digital error so we do come across no, these no, it's okay it's accepted now yeah. right sir. so uh, yeah. as you know sir the pandemic is still going on yeah yeah most of the population has is getting vaccinated plus with the third wave around the corner we wish you safety and prosperity and uh, dr neeraj is with us so dr neeraj any closing comments from your end i would like to thank uh, all of you and the audience for their excellent questions thank you for the opportunity given right yeah neeraj Thank you. Thank, Thank you, sir. You. Thank good you. Night. Good night and good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you.